Well, good. Well, welcome, welcome back, everybody. I, I, I trust you're all fluent in either Mandarin or Arabic by now. Um, anyway, we've got one talk before lunch, and if I can find my notes, um, I'm pleased to welcome um, Alexander Evans, who is the sort of person that you need to know. Um, I've known Alex for a long time, and when for various reasons, if you ever try running events, you will find that people say they'll speak and then they drop out. And you need to have a friend like Alex who you can ring up <clears throat> at about a fortnight's notice and with very, very little arm twisting and causation of pain, say something along the lines of, you would like to talk, wouldn't you? And be sure that you'll get the answer yes. So I'm very grateful to Alexander. He's Professor of Public Policy at the London School of Economics. He was a career diplomat and was in Pakistan and Afghanistan, if I remember rightly. Um, strategy Director in the, and an Acting High Commissioner in India. And he led the UN Security Council expert group on uh, various terrorist organizations. Um, and he's going to talk to us about Asian geopolitics in the Indian Ocean. Alex, thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Adrian. And, and hello, everybody. Um, now, it's a really dangerous time to try and speak just before lunch, isn't it? You know, like the thing of um, part one of the things I teach at the LSE is decision making. Uh, and it turns out that if you make a decision just after breakfast, you generally make quite a good decision. If you make a decision just before lunch, you're generally hangry and you make worse decisions. So I'm going to try and keep my keep my remarks fairly short uh, and open them up for questions. And I'm going to start somewhere. Well, just before I start, maybe just to um, Adrian asked me to just say a little bit about kind of, you know, career options and pathways. So I, I, um, I studied at, um, at the LSE as an undergraduate. I studied international relations. I then went on to do a PhD um, very slowly and very badly. I took 16 years to do my PhD uh, on South Asia. Um, and uh, I worked in various think tanks and then, and then worked, as, as Adrian says, in, in, in the uh, joined the Foreign Office. But there's lots of different kind of career options around Asia if you are interested in, in Asia and the Asian space or Asian issues. Um, my fascination was with India and Pakistan and Afghanistan. I was a, as a student. Uh, I then went back as a postgraduate student. I did a PhD on it. I commented for BBC News in the 1990s, back in the days when TikTok didn't even exist, um, and, and um, have maintained my interest throughout. So, so just, you know, there are lots of ways of applying an interest in Asia into careers. Um, so I'm going to start here with um, a picture of this. Um, anybody, uh, anybody got a clue about what the uh, what the thing on the right might be? Crocodile, alligator. You know, you know, You can tell that you know the biology study hasn't been quite as close as it should be. It's one of the two, right? Um, so this is in Bhutan. This is in Bhutan. And you might wonder why am I starting a talk on Asian geopolitics in Bhutan? If you know anything about Bhutan, it's a country that nestles in the Himalayas. It's known for gross national happiness and for being quite a peaceful place. But when I, I used to go and visit there, and I was taken by my hosts in Bhutan to visit this uh, crocodile uh, sanctuary or crocodile park. And my host said, look, on the one hand, on the one side, you've got crocodiles. And on the other side, we've got alligators. And in the ponds are fish for them to eat. And the key thing you don't want to be is a fish that becomes big enough to be eaten. Right? So, and I was thinking, like, is this about crocodiles and alligators, or is he trying to give me a message? Yeah. And actually, he was trying to give me a message. He was saying that actually, if you are a small country like Bhutan, one of the things you have to worry about is not being swallowed up or overcome by large neighbors. And Bhutan sits between China and India. And there are plenty of um, places around there that used to be independent countries but aren't anymore, Sikkim, Tibet, and so on. Um, so, you know, it just, just geopolitics may seem abstract, but it's pretty real if you run the risk of losing your country or, or citizenship. And we see in Ukraine right now, right, the real consequences, as it were, of, of some of that. Obviously, we are living in a, in a complex world. Uh, I was thinking about a photograph from today or last night. I was doing an election party last night at LSE till about half past 11. Uh, but I'm going to choose a, a, a newspaper headlines from 2019, right? So Financial Times in 2019, Vladimir Putin, the liberal idea has become obsolete. 
the New York Times, US-China, a new era of great power competition. So in the last you know, uh, five to 10 years, we've moved back into a world where geopolitics and frictions and war or the risk of war seems a lot more present than was true in the late 1990s, where mainly I worried about whether I could get um, uh, uh, medium speed broadband uh, and could I get, you know, could I get, uh, you know, uh, cappuccinos uh, close to where I lived in, in West Hampstead at the time? Yeah. And there is a history around geopolitics. Sadly, the history is often slightly black and white, sepia tinged uh, old men, right? White men. So let's take two of them. Um, Halford Mackinder, who was actually the director of the LSE, he was a geographer. Um, and uh, Captain uh, Alfred Mahan, who is a, 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 an American naval captain. And these are considered to be two of the kind of authors of some of the big themes around geopolitics. And Mackinder talked about the geographical pivot of history in 1904. He said geography really matters and geography on land really matters. Who controls the bulk of land? Who controls the bulk of Asia or the bulk of Europe on land or the bulk of West Africa, wherever it might be? That, that, that state tends to then dominate local politics and, and international relations. Mahan, on the other hand, talked about the influence of sea power in history, writing a little bit earlier in 1890. And he was saying, actually, no, no, no. The people who really have power, the states, the countries that have real power in the world, are states that actually control sea trade, control maritime traffic, have navies. So two very different conceptions of a world. And it's relevant for how we think a bit about Asia and Asian geopolitics today. I love old maps. Uh, here's one from 19. Uh, uh, this is one from 1952, and it's um, it published in in Time magazine, which was a big magazine in America in the 1950s. And what you see, this is a magazine showing um, uh, Europe from Moscow, and Asia from Okhotsk, also in 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 Russia. And this is a classic example of propaganda maps. Right? Forget memes. Forget um, disinformation. Right? This is accurate because it's a map of Europe and it's a map of Asia, but would you feel a bit freaked out if you're sitting in um, if you're sitting in London with all this red kind of like moving towards you? And might you feel a bit uh, a bit upset if you're Australia, where you've kind of been like you've been put out to the side? And I think New Zealand doesn't even get a look in, right? Um, so this is a way of using maps to represent the world, but also to communicate something about the balance of power and the balance of threat in the world. Um, and today we're seeing a renewed debate about China's role in Asia and the world. And some would argue that China um, poses risks and threats um, to neighboring countries or indeed to the global order. Others would disagree with that. Let's roll back to the 1970s. This is a bit retro. Uh, and this is these are pictures in the 1970s, uh, late 60s and early 70s of the uh, of the Soviet, the Russian Soviet fleet in the Indian Ocean. So in the 1970s, the Indian Ocean had a big competition between the Soviet Union and the United States. And the competition was over who had control and access to the most ports. And at one stage in the, in, in the, uh, in, in the 70s, um, the US and its allies were restricted to only four ports in the Indian Ocean. All the other ports were denied access to them. So there was a bit of a debate about, again, it was shadow boxing. It was like, who has most influence? But in the event of a real war, that shadow boxing would have become more real and it would have been about long range bombers and submarines and naval ships. The debate in the 1970s in America was to make sure that the Indian Ocean didn't become a Soviet dominated ocean. And some of the debate today about the South China Sea or about the Indian Ocean in 10 years time is to make sure again that no single state, no single Navy dominates uh, that space. Uh, and that's some of the debate that will inform uh, the incoming Trump presidency uh, confirmed what about a, an hour and a half ago uh, by the um, outcome in Wisconsin's uh, state election. And you might say, well, okay, oceans, that's all a bit, that's all a bit, that's all a bit random, right? Why is this dude up here talking about oceans, right? Why, do, why would oceans matter to me? Why does the Indian Ocean matter to people in the UK? Well, a chunk of it matters because we get lots of our things from there. If you've ordered anything from Zara or Temu or Shine, if you've basically bought, uh, if you bought any bit of fast fashion uh, in the last couple of years, 
if you bought anything, any form of technology in the last couple of years, most likely it traveled by container ship. And most likely it traveled by container ship across the ocean, uh, most likely into Southampton, but it may have been to, into other ports in the UK. And what you see here, this is from the International Maritime Organization, but you see in 2010, the pattern of global trade by sea was largely um, America-centric. And yet we, you know, the, the predictions are that by 2030, most of the patterns of trade by sea will be China-centric. It will start to look very differently. And you'll see much deeper trade moving across the uh, Indian Ocean. So the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean become more important not less important uh, to international trade. That's not just, by the way, whether I can get my uh, uh, my really nice new, uh, you know, so my cheap new six pounds eighty watch via Temu. It's also important in terms of getting energy, right? So this is a key route for oil and gas, liquefied natural gas shipments uh, by sea. And just to show how important that South, that Indian Ocean piece is, do you see here? You've got the Middle East in the middle. And then you've got Southeast Asia, you've got South Asia and China. So the dominant flow of trade uh, for crude oil will be will be likely be in this space in the Indian Ocean by 2030. So here is an example of an area of the world that's becoming more important, not less. And it's more important not because of guns or ideas. It's coming important because so much trade flows across it. And that, that's key to how countries get power. It's key to how China gets energy. It's key to how um, uh, the UK gets much of its trade as well. And I won't stick with that. There's also a debate, of course, about what power means in this world. Does it mean, um, you know, is it about aircraft carriers? Is it about alliances? Is it about armies? Uh, or is it actually about technology? Is it, is it the ability to hack into other people's computers or disable uh, phone networks? Um, and that debate is rattling on. There's a debate, too, about rare earths, rare earths. So if, uh, who's got a phone in the room? Quick show of hands. Oh, that was an easy one, wasn't it? Uh, so your phone has got rare earths in it, right? It's got basically rare, uh, rare metals in it that are largely found today in China, largely found today in China. And, and there's been a lot of work by Australia, by the United States, by others, even the UK in Cornwall. Uh, around lithium mining to try and open up different sources of, of, of um, supply. Again, it's not an anti-China move. It's just that argument. You don't want to rely on one, you know, just as we don't want to rely on one friend, you want somebody else to call when you have a difference of view with that friend. You, you want to have potentially optionality around supplies of, uh, of materials. But it turns out actually an awful lot of these materials, and you see here, do you see the chart on the right shows you just how dominant China is in global production. But actually, it turns out that most of these rare earths are in the deep ocean. They're found around, um, they're found around the Clipperton Trench, um, so some of these deep sea trenches in the Pacific um, and in, uh, in the Indian Ocean. So potentially, you could look at deep sea mining in the future. That could make oceans even more important, and some of the technology is already there. Is this science fiction? No, it isn't. This is a picture of a diamond mining vessel off Namibia. This, this vessel basically goes out and mines for diamonds. And you might think diamonds, they come from either a lab or they come from a mine on land. But in, in, in Namibia, in recent years, more of the diamonds, more of the um, uh, rough diamonds, as it were, mined in, um, outside, are coming from the ocean and they're already being mined by sea. So some of this technology isn't science fiction. In the 1970s and 80s, it was science fiction. Today, it's real. And, and it's already been used in diamond mining. Now, that's all the Mahan world, right? Oceans, 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 which is why governments from Australia to the UK, from France uh, to India, from Japan to the United States, have been talking about Indo-Pacific strategies and the Indo-Pacific as a zone in the world, right? And Indo-Pacific is really about two oceans and the countries that flow around those. But a different view would be a more land-based view, a more Mackinder view of the world. This is the Zoji La Pass, uh, which is at 11,600 feet. This is, uh, I took this photo, I've been up for it a number of times. And it, it runs from India up into the Himalaya as you go up over to the Chinese border in Ladakh. Um, and actually there's been border clashes between India and China, both in Ladakh, very close to this pass, 
uh, where, where soldiers have actually kind of like fought each other um, and and along the border up in Bhutan, uh, where Bhutan, uh, um, India and China meet. So the other view is actually well, it's not about oceans. That's all sort of one thing. Actually, most wars happen on land. Most conflict happens on land. Most m much trade also takes place on land. And the land perspective is what the Russians and the Chinese talk about more. So this is Sergei Karaganov. I promise you it's the only academic article I'm going to show you. It's OK. So this is a safe space. Um, but Karaganov um, is a Russian is a Russian professor who has been writing for a long time uh, about the new Cold War and the emerging greater Eurasia. So what you hear from the Russians a lot more is talk about Eurasia. Whereas the Americans and American allies will talk more about the Indo-Pacific. And what they're reflecting in some ways is ideas that go all the way back to Halfa Mackinder and to Alfred Mahan. So it's not just, you know, the ideas aren't just kind of a book in a library. These ideas animate and influence decision making and policy to this day. And shaping ideas matter, right? Different conceptions of Asia shape different contemporary uh, um, shape contemporary Asian geopolitics. But it's not as simple as a US or a China Russia perspective, right? There are lots of other countries in play, and each of those countries will have views of its own. Uh, what Japan means by the Indo-Pacific is slightly different to what Australia means. Vietnam's perspective is going to be slightly different to Sri Lanka's perspective. So it's very tempting, again, to focus on uh, you know, the Taylor Swifts of international affairs, right? To focus on the largest countries with the most power or the most influence. And actually, it's really important to look at all countries and to listen to all countries and find out how they, how they see the world as well. What you do see is the British government, this is a former Foreign Secretary, James Cleverley, giving a speech on Indo-Pacific tilt in September 2022. You see this successive governments here in recent years talking about the Indo-Pacific more, talking about China more, and using language around the Indo-Pacific in government policymaking. And it's not just, again, about trade or about um, uh, aircraft carriers or about armies. It's also about growing economic and technological competition, right? So uh, on the one hand, you've got um, my friend Chris Miller, who's a professor at um, Tufts University in Boston in the US. And Chris wrote this brilliant book called Chip War a couple of years ago, which is all about the geopolitical competition on chips. And chips obviously are a key part of computers and you know, laptops and tablets and are essential to most modern technology. If you drive a car, but is, uh, you know, if you, you're going to get in a car uh, or any piece of machinery that is less than 10 years old, it's likely to have chips in it. And Adam Toos, who's another professor, a Brit actually living in uh, now, he was at Yale, but he's now at Columbia. Adam, Adam is an economic historian. So what, a lot of what he's written about is a history of trade and economics. It's also important about which countries produce the most. You know, who, who, and it's not just whether you produce cars or chemicals or fast fashion. It's also, do you produce data? Do you produce services? You know, what, what's, the, what's the scale of that and what's the relationship of that? So these are also two dimensions of the geopolitics that are happening. So India, a couple of years ago, for example, banned TikTok because it felt that Chinese data, you know, that, that the influence of Chinese data on India wouldn't be a good thing. But India is still using lots of Chinese technology in its, uh, in its 5G telecoms network. And you can buy lots of Indi uh, Chinese goods in, in India. Um, in fact, trade has grown. Finally, emotions matter. Emotions matter. Um, so I'm going to ask you something very quickly. Uh, with if Adrian tells me I've got another, have I got another five minutes? What do you think? Yes, sir. Good. All right. So quick question: Who remembers what they had for lunch a week ago? Hands up. Hands up. Hands up. Come on. Come on. You're all young. You have got memories. You can't forget things. You're not. You know. You're not my age, right? Okay. We have. Thank you very much. We have six hands went up. Six hands went up in a room. Okay. Different question. Trigger warning, trigger warning, okay? Who remembers somebody from primary school who upset you? Hands up, right? Who is actually in the, in the playground right now going, oh, I remember that far too well, right? So, so this is just an example, right? This is part of what I teach at the LSE is behavioral science, right? So neuroscience of decision-making. And the way we remember, we think our memories are perfect machines, right? It's like a computer. We can just pull the email back or pull the file back. Um, 
Did you notice there that people, we don't, we actually delete, we auto delete what we had for lunch last week. We don't auto delete a humiliation or something that really upsets us or a moment that scares us. So when my older daughter nearly choked some years ago, that is a, me a memory that will stay with me for a very long time because it, you know, it's, it's a, a moment of crisis, as it were. And that, it's relevant to geopolitics as well, because many wars and crises begin accidentally. They don't begin because somebody woke up on Tuesday morning and said, you know what I'd really like to do? I'd like to invade the country next door. It happens sometimes, but most of the time, wars develop by accident or by a set of uh, steps and decisions that lead to conflict. And national pride can shape or constrain decision-making around that. If you feel humiliated, you might feel angry, you might feel you might make decisions that are a bit more closer to lunch than closer to breakfast. Um, and misperception is a real feature of life, right? Do you remember that time when a friend did something and you thought, you're, you're dissing me, or you've deliberately upset me? Who's had a, who, who has a friend in the room who's had an experience like that, right? So you know that thing where, where somebody does something or they send you a message or they don't send you a message and you interpret it as a deliberate, a deliberate slight to you. But when you actually chat about it with your friend later, you realize that's not what they meant at all. Yeah? So we tend to think that when we do something, you know, we're doing it for good motives, we tend to overread what other people do when they do it to us. And that's relevant for um, decision making. The other thing that's relevant, and I'm nerdy, in fact, uh, Michael and I were just talking about declassified documents, secret documents in safes in the Foreign Office and other places, right? I teach using declassified documents, documents that used to be secret and are now released. And one of the documents I like, this is a CIA document from 1982, and it's about preparing the warning system to deal with surprise. Who has experienced surprise in the last two years? Yeah? Who has been, pre who prepares for surprise every day? Yeah, one, one very prepared person up in the back. There you are. Um, life coaching and lessons available from her later. Uh, you know, she'll charge you a small amount. Uh, there'll, be a, there'll be a monetized Instagram on that soon. Um, but a bit of a challenge around surprise is surprise is again, really normal, right? Surprise is normal in our lives. It's normal in policy making. And yet we are really badly prepared for surprise. And part of a challenge on, on geopolitics in Asia is actually we don't really know where the next crisis will come from. It might be a US-China crisis over Taiwan. It might be an India-China crisis. It might be a crisis between Indonesia and Australia. As peculiar as that might seem right now, that hasn't always been a relationship that's been positive. We don't know, but we do probably know that at some stage there will be another crisis and different governments and, and citizens have to respond to that. So finally, what about geopolitics in, in, in the Indo-Pacific? The main risk is probably a US-China crisis, whether that's over the future of Taiwan or over something else. Um, and relations between China and the US are not great. An India-China crisis is also possible, but also, as I said, it could be just something else, right? A surprise that we haven't considered, including through technology or other changes. So things that we didn't anticipate at the time. The future is not as knowable as we think it is. What remains true is that geopolitical uncertainty is infecting everything. This is, this is the long COVID of the 21st century, right? It's infecting everything we do. And it has an impact on trade. It has an impact on technology. It has an impact on ideas, how we conceive of Asia. You have these different prisms to think about relationships in Asia. Um, and we see trends towards deglobalization, so less international trade, um, onshoring, so bringing business back to your country because you don't quite trust the other countries it's going to take place in, or what's called uh, friendshoring, right? And friendshoring basically, again, is, is only relying on your friends and more competition. So finally, we are becoming, all of us are becoming, not just in Asia, around the world, we're, both become, we're becoming both more and less Bhutanese. We're Bhutanese because we want to have peace and gross national happiness, but we're also Bhutanese because we're worrying about a world in which crocodiles and alligators are always present. Thanks very much. Well, Alex, uh, Alexander, thank you very much. You've given us a lot to think about there. Um, just, just to kick things off, um, uh, the very obvious question, what's 
been the effect of the in taking taking just the title what's been the effect on this of of of, of, of the chinese Bel belt and road initiative i mean one thinks of the port in sri lanka that they now own yeah, so, so uh, for, for, it, does everybody know what the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative is in the room? A few nods, a lot of people like doing the kind of like, maybe I did the reading, maybe I didn't. Um, but so the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative is, is billions of dollars of money that has been spent by China um, building infrastructure around Asia and indeed around the world in places like Peru, as well as in countries like Sri Lanka. It's put money into building ports, roads, railways, um, the kind of infrastructure that's needed to support trade. But some people have also been nervous because they said, well, if you build a big deep port in Sri Lanka, for example, this is at Haban Tota in Sri Lanka, that port could be used for, um, for shipping vessels, but it could also be used for uh, military vessels, for Navy vessels. So there's been a worry about the dual use for capability around some of these things. I, I, I'm not, you know, I, I think on BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, by the way, government loves acronyms. If you do want to create a government, prepare for acronyms. Okay, um, it, but BRI, I think, is not probably. You know, some people think it is a massively geopolitical play, and it has a geopolitical impact. But also, a lot of the debt, you know, a lot of it has been lending money, right? So this has been like Klarna for international relations, right? Money has been lent by China to other countries to build these facilities, and now a lot of countries are struggling to pay that back. Um, so it's not always clear that it'll be an advantage or an asset for China. It may also be a liability. Hi, um, what do you think the impact of Trump coming in as president will have on relations in the Indian Ocean? Sorry. Thank you. Well, well, obviously, you know, last night I was doing the LSE election party. We didn't know at that stage what the result would be. It's very clear and, and it is a confirmed victory now for uh, Donald Trump and a second administration. Um, the first Trump administration was much stronger on China, was much harder on China than previous governments have been in the United States. Um, and, you know, there was, there was a lot more kind of, um, uh, you know, a hardening of policy. People sometimes say, well, that's all about Trump. And actually, a lot of it was also about um, movement in Congress in the US, a movement by both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, so for a lot of people in the US, there was a sense that um, this offshoring process, that a lot more trade flows and manufacturing in China um, wasn't really helping jobs in America. And that was a view that you know, informed both Biden uh, and Kamala Harris and, and indeed um, Trump as well. Uh, what do I think it means? Uh, well, I'll be doing a press conference tomorrow morning at the LSE uh, for the international press, where I'll probably be able to give you more considered thoughts on that. But I think we should expect um, a, a more, more turbulence in that US-China relationship. Because for the Chinese, Chinese governments and Chinese diplomats, they like stability. They like predictability. And if there's one thing we do know about Donald Trump, is predictability is not his strong point, right? So we're unlikely to see deep predictability in behavior. The other ingredient around Trump's policy agenda, but as he set it out um, in advance of the election, is tariffs. So basically imposing more import tariffs on trade. And that potentially has a major impact on China because it potentially reduces China's growth rate. So, and China's growth rate has already been slowing. So for China, this is going to be pretty consequential. For US-China ties, it may be consequential. Um, and the final element is, is that Trump has said both vis-a-vis -vis Asia, but also vis-a-vis -vis Europe. He said, why should Americans uh, provide uh, money to fund European or Asian security? Uh, shouldn't Europeans and Asians pay more money to pay for their security themselves? So I think you, you've, seen, you've seen a drive to encourage countries to increase defense spending. Uh, and, and the trouble is, you know, it's always a trade-off, right? And you see that in the UK as well, the trade-off every every hundred pounds more you spend on defense that's a hundred pounds less for housing or for job creation or whatever else it might be um so i would say unpredictability but certainly more more friction potentially and more competition not just for us china but for but, but between trading countries as well good afternoon i just wanted to ask um you talked about how the US and China don't have a very healthy relationship at the moment. Do you ever see in the foreseeable future that 
their their relationships will improve and they'll be cooperative with each other. Yeah, so so look, I, surprise. Remember that 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 document I put up on the screen. Surprise works both ways, right? Who's had a good surprise in in, in the room at some stage in your life? Yeah, who's had a bad surprise in your life? Right. So we've all experienced it. Right. And and you know, a bit of it depends on our mood. Right. If you are feeling pessimistic, it's Tuesday. It's when what was it? Today? It's Wednesday, isn't it? It's Wednesday morning and you haven't yet had lunch. You might feel a little bit pessimistic right now. Right. When's this guy going to stop talking? When can I eat lunch? Right. Um, the mood music internationally right now is quite pessimistic. So we tend to think about things getting worse because of some of this geopolitics going on. But actually, surprise works in both ways, and things could get better as well. And, and US-China relations have gotten better before. Uh, and remember, US-China relations in the 1970s got better under a Republican president, under Richard Nixon. So it's not exclusive to one party or another in the US for relations to improve. Um, but, but at least the current signals are not necessarily super positive. Hi there. Um, what would you, in your expert opinion, say is the biggest obstacle the West faces in maintaining dominance over China and its allies? Well, first of all, I would say that West hasn't got dominance over China. Uh, I mean, I think I think we we are already living in a world where, um, you know, peak America in terms of peak American economic power, uh, you know, yeah, you know, it might come back again because of concentration about AI. Remember, surprise again works in mysterious ways, um, but. Uh, the domination of America and allies of the global economy was far greater in the late 1990s than it is today. You know, the rise of India, the rise of China, but the rise of actually many other countries, Turkey, the UAE, um, Pakistan, um, Indonesia, you know, there's a whole range of, um, actually Kenya, uh, you know, a, a, range of, a range of economies um, across, across the world have grown. Um, so I think I think that you know I would I would choose to answer your question by in the classic diplomatic way by answering a question I wanted you to ask rather than ask, uh, answering a question that you've asked, which is to say what does that mean for democracy, right? Because it, you know whatever you might think, like you know I would argue it's better to live in a democracy than live in a authoritarian state, um, for all the imperfections of democracies, um, and actually in, in this balance now you know the reality is we're living in a world of 193 countries. And some of the decisions around world order are taken amongst those 193. Standards decisions. Some of the international agreement decisions are taken by 193. Who has ever tried to organize a weekend activity with 10 friends via WhatsApp? Yeah, how easy is that? Nightmare, right? Is that fair to say? I mean, even if you do a doodle poll, what about the cinema? Or shall we meet at Wagamama? Oh, you know, like, wait, three people have responded, and there's always one person who doesn't respond to the WhatsApp chain at all, right? Because they muted you two weeks ago. Um, so there's a challenge here around. There's a challenge here around 193 countries. It's difficult to organise 193 countries. The UN Secretary General can't do it. America can't do it. China can't do it. Um, given the resources, because you mentioned earlier uh, deglobalization, given the resources that Asia has, do you think deglobalization is in any way sustainable or is like relations between different countries just an ultimate like necessary action for growth? Yeah, no, so look, I, I have my biases, right? Each of us have our own views. I'm, I'm very pro international trade. I think it's good for lifting people out of poverty. Um, I think it's good for everybody from uh, people working in factories in China and Bangladesh, to uh, uh, people growing green beans in Kenya, to uh, people, uh, you know, uh, you know, tech companies in Colombia, to uh, companies in the UK, right? And remember, we are an economy in the UK that largely depends on services, and a lot of the flow of those services run across borders. Um, so I, I, I'm a fan of trade. Now, it's not trade, free trade at any cost, but I think free trade generally is a positive for development. It's a positive for economic growth, and it's a positive for us as consumers. Um, the the mood music internationally now is much more against free trade, um, but I, I would particularly emphasize that development argument. Free trade and liberalizing trade did more to lift people out of poverty around the world and more to eliminate starvation than all the development aid that countries have done in, in, since, since the Second World War. 
So the combination of free trade and remittances, by the way, it's not just free trade in services or goods, it's also about people. Nearly 6 million British people live outside the UK. And the UK, as we all know, right, London is a super diverse city. It's a global city. Um, I'm married to an American. I, my kids are you know, American and, and British. I, I'm a fan of that flow of people and ideas. But it's also true you're going to have countries that want to protect certain forms of industry, certain forms of production. Countries want to protect their borders as well. And those are legitimate choices, I think. Um, but I, you know, I, I would still say two cheers for free trade, even if the world is not very pro-free trade right now. What uh, do you believe it, uh, in terms of the development of the relations between China and Russia? Um, so, look, the China-Russia relationship is a really important uh, duet in Asia because these are the two, well, China, Russia and India are the three biggest land, you know, territorial states on, on the Asian continent. By the way, just remember, Asia, is, Asia isn't really a thing because Asia was invented by people outside Asia, right? So, so to, you know, remember where you sit influences on how you think about the world. Is everybody in the room from London or are, people, are some people coming from outside London? Everybody pretty a few people in from outside London. But you know, I, look, I in London, I live in Queen's Park in Northwest London, right? So my perspective on London is a bit Queen's Parky. But I did live in Wood Green for a bit and I lived down in 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 Rotherhive back in the day. So I've got, you know, you know, each of us will have a different emotional geography about London. Each of us has a different emotional geography depending where we sit. Uh, the China-Russia relationship is not an equal relationship. Back, you know, 50 years ago. Russia, the Soviet Union, was the dominant state and China was the subservient state. Not subservient, but China was in, in a weaker position. Today, China is in a much stronger position than Russia. It's a much bigger economy. It has much more, you know, many more people, a uh, bigger military, uh, a, a stronger technological base. Um, and I think the challenge there is China and Russia, Russia wants to work with China because Russia is continuing to proceed with uh, invasion and the war in Ukraine. Um, but actually, for China, there's there's fewer benefits to the relationship with Russia. Um, but it, it's clearly a, a relationship that has grown closer, uh, including closer in the last couple of years. Um, but it's not it's not a marriage of all interests because I think Chinese and Russian interests also diverge. The Russian state right now is much uh, more risk. It has a higher risk appetite um, than China. Uh, just a reminder of a, a, a few months ago, a, a senior British official described the Russians as, go, as going a bit feral, right? So in terms of their international behavior, Russia right now takes much greater risk. China is, a, China is generally a pretty structured um, actor in the international stage. So slightly different, different tones of engagement. One last quick question. Um... If Western foreign policy continues focusing on China and the Indo-Pacific, as you talked about, what do you think that means for Eastern Europe? Um, so, look, it's not a case of either or, right? And in fact, you see that right now. North Korean troops have just gone to Russia to fight in Ukraine. Um, and if you don't resist tyranny in one space, you run the risk of falling victim to tyranny in another. So I don't think there's an easy way of saying, well, Russia's on this side and China's on another side. Um, you know, there is a, there's a connective tissue between them. Um, I, I, I do think it's a little bit like, it's a little bit like, you know, everything everywhere all at once, right? The reality is that um, Britain is a global actor. We have global interests. Um, Britain has local, you know, you know, Europe has, for Europe, the Ukraine crisis is more immediate. If you're sitting in, in East Asia, if you're Japan or Korea uh, or the Philippines, uh, China, is more immediate and the challenges around the South China Sea. Um, so so I, I, I would argue a bit of, again, it's, there's radical uncertainty around the future, and perhaps I'll close here. You know, and that radical uncertainty is why geopolitics, the, the, the combination of radical uncertainty and the long COVID of geopolitics is not a good combination. Um, and it argues for insurance policies. I'm afraid it does argue for spending probably a bit more money on defence. Um, and it argues for being ready and more resilient because the world is a more dangerous place today than it was when i joined the foreign office in 2003 well on that slightly depressing note <laughs> um alexander thank you very much indeed that was you know 
given us huge amounts to think about. Thank you. Um, lunch is now, if you go upstairs and out and to the left along to the to the next building, um, Charles from SOAS should be there to show you the way. And if we can be back for half past one, please. Thanks a lot, Alexander. Thank you all. Thanks.